Hello, everyone. Welcome to Automation Hour. And um, if you're joining us for the first time, all lines are muted. Please post your questions to the Salesforce Automation Hour Trailblazer community. Uh, we will be posting a link to the recording as well as the deck afterwards on the Trailblazer community as well as on our website, automationhour.com. And um, if you have not signed up for uh, our sessions for the rest of 2019, um, highly recommend that you do so. We have a couple of NVPs who will be presenting as well as some repeat um, presenters. So even if you cannot attend live, please register and you get a link to the recording after the fact. And if you have a business use case with a cool automation solution that you would like to share on Automation Hour, please direct message us offline. We will be reaching out um, in the couple of months to start scheduling for 2020. Oh, I have. And we cannot bring this free webinar series to you without Concrete IO. So thank you for being our sponsor. And here are your co-hosts, David, myself, and Rakesh. And with that, we're excited to bring on Monica Sandberg. It's her first time presenting. Uh, she presented the same presentation at Midwest Dreaming, and I heard uh, there are great things about it. So we're excited to <coughs> have her on here to share that with you. So with that, let me hand over control to Monica. You should have control now. All right. Can we see yep. it? I can see it? it. All right. So, hello, everybody. I'm thrilled to have you join me here today. I'm going to tell you and show you how I built my very own automation command center. I did it 100% code free. And trust me, if I can do this, you can too. I'm Monica Sandberg. I'm known in the community as not is blank Monica. You can reach out on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on my blog, notisblank.net or notisblank.com. All right. So, Ohana, can we talk? Can we share those intimate secrets? Now, all of us, we're friends here. We can say anything, right? So, can we talk? How do you feel? I mean, what would happen if I were to say I'm changing presenter role over to you right this minute and we're all going to look at your automation. We're going to check out all of your automation solutions. How would you feel this very moment if we did it? I mean, would you be embarrassed? Would you say, no, 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 not me, not me, not me? Or would you show it freely? Well, I have to tell you, can we talk? I mean, the reality is some of us just aren't quite happy with everything that's going on in our automation. And this is me at one point. Some days I still feel this way. It's just like, don't look, that's not quite how I wanted it. It's not quite, but we'd all, this is it. This is Nirvana for an admin. We would love our automation to be more like this. Really organized, really clear, everything in its place, everything matches. We could mix and match anything from our automation collection and get the results we want and solve our business processes. This would be wonderful. But is this reality? This is it, Friday. Oh, it could be today. 515, you're walking out the door. You're out the door. You're in the hallway and ring, 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 ring it on your phone. All these emails coming in, error, 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 rollback operations. Ay, 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 what are you going to do? This happens. And even with testing, no matter what you do, there's sometimes there's going to be some unanticipated consequence of something in your org, which is going to lead to this. And then the question is, what do we do? How do we minimize those 515 on a Friday uh, 
emails. I mean, those are just, they're not fun. How do we know where our automation is? How do we get that beautiful closet automation where everything is just works together and the daisy, if we do have daisy chain, we know where one automation starts and one ends and where how it all works together. That is the challenge. And where do we start? Well, let's start Salesforce best practice. That's That seems like a logical place to start. Build in a test environment. Okay, I can do that. I have my dev org. I have sandboxes. That one, okay, Salesforce, All right, you got that one. For each object, one automation tool. This one is a little more challenging. I, can we talk? I mean, can we? Can I, can I tell you the truth here? I still have workflow rules. I do. I have workflow rules for my outbound messages using Conga. I have outbound, I have workflow rules for my formulas are too big to execute and I'm using workflow rules as my workaround. And then I was one of the first people to use Flow, one of the early adopters. I used Flow before it was even built into the Salesforce platform. It was like separate app at one point. And I've been using that. Oh yes, you know me on Process Builder. And then don't even talk about Lightning Actions and then good old workflow rules. oops a doodle uh-oh. And the next one, have only one record change process per object. Now this one I understand completely. Developers have been doing this a long time with the one trigger per object. But I gotta tell you, can we talk? I have played around with this and I have, I'm not there yet. I'm gonna be honest with you. I am not there yet to the one record change process per object. And since I'm not there yet, I'm looking for solutions. I would love to do this. And actually, when you see a little bit of Flow Builder, that's probably the direction to go in. If you're ready to go there with reformatting and trying to get one process change per object, but sometimes we have apex rules. We have other things going on in our org that are necessary. So not so easy. So what did I do? Well, I looked in the app. I looked around for a solution and I'll tell you what I wanted and what I couldn't find. I wanted one place to see all my automation. I wanted to see my processes and my flows and some of my workflows that that trigger a process or that make a record change that's related. I wanted to see everything down one list. I wanted to know what was happening and have notes there and why and how. And then I wanted to be able to, from there, not go hunt for it and deactivate and reactivate and deactivate. I wanted a little switch that I could go on, off, on, off. And that's, Take it even one step further. I, I had a big wish list here. I wanted my solutions to be on for one user and off for another. So if I was doing a bulk operation, I wanted it to be off for the bulk operation user, but everyone else could use that automation so that I wouldn't have that 515 email. And I couldn't find it. So I got in a dev org and I just started messing around. And a lot of hours later, many, many, many days and uh, over and over and over of figuring out what works best. I came up with the Automation Command Center and I'm so excited, super excited, super excited to show it to you. But first, you gotta hang on here. Whoa, 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 wait. We as admins, we can do things we never could do before. We do things that developers used to do. I mean, it's unheard of the amount of power we have now with the tools that Salesforce has given us. We can do things, but whoa, 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 we need to step back. We need to step back and learn and think and see really how Salesforce is handling our automation. What is involved? What is interacting? And get back to the fundamentals. So the first thing is what mode is our automation running in? Are we in system mode? Are we in user mode? And that's super important, not only for before you build to know this, 
really, we should be spending as much time on automation as we do with our data model, as much thought into it. But you're going to see that user and system mode really make a difference, especially uh, with your solutions on the next thing. Where are we running our automation front? Uh, is a user clicking a button? Is a change to a record triggering the automation to run in the background? Are we using one process to invoke another process? Are we using platform events, which now are available to us? There are so many different configurations with flow and how many ways you can run a flow that we really need to understand these and what happens and the implications of each one. Order of operations. So what happens in a transaction? That's another question. What is a transaction? We could do session on session on just this page, but we're not going to. I'm going to go through it kind of quickly, but I want you to spend some time and learn all about all of these things. Order of operations. So if I have uh, uh, one of our developers created an APEX trigger, and then I've done workflow rules, and then I have processes, and don't forget approvals, and you also have validation rules, and so many things happening that Salesforce is doing in a certain order in that transaction that will affect whether your automation is going to give you the results that you anticipated, the results that you're after. So we need to understand this. And a reason that we get those emails on the Friday at 515 usually have to do with limits. And this wasn't as big of an issue when we were talking about workflow rules. Workflow rules, I, mean, I never hit an, a limit with a workflow rule, but they didn't have the power that we have now either and the capabilities and functionality that we had now. So now with Process Builder and Flows and Apex, we have CPU time limits, we have SQL uh, limits, we have DML limits, and as admins, we really should understand these so that when we're building, we are not running into these kind of errors. And the last thing, and there are many more things about automation than what I have here, I'm just trying to get you to imagine, to think, to move forward in your education on automation, is that when we're building, we run into this pattern of business use case, build automation. Business use case, build automation. Business use case, build automation. And we go on and on and on and on. And then we have that closet at the very one of the first slides that looks like that. We have no idea really what's happening. We can't find anything we don't know. And so really, if you can't get to the one solution per object, then we really need some type of pattern. And we should be doing this anyway. We should have a design pattern. And I found this on um, Medium. It was an article by Alex Petey, and his uh, model seemed to make sense to me. It worked for me. It was something that I could get a hold of, that I could say, yes, I'm going to go through and refactor best I can with what I have and try and fit my automation into these four categories. So I'm not saying this is the only one, and there are many, many different ways to do this, but this is just one that helped me, and it's something to consider at least having some type of pattern for building your automation. System mode versus um, user mode. When you're in system mode, it's almost like God mode. Your workflow rules work this way. Process builder works this way the predefined values on your actions. So your user, whoever presses the button, your running user, whoever fills out, you know, uh, does something and changes a record that initiates this, they don't have to have all of their permissions to do the action that you're trying to do with your uh, process or with your root workflow rule. But in user mode, when we have a screen flow, if our running user doesn't have permission and we're trying to create an object, we're going to run into a bit of a problem because we're running in user mode. And our actions, the user visibility and whether the user can edit things matters as to what the permissions and sharing are for a running user. And these limits, we've talked 
about this just a few minutes ago, you're probably thinking, some of you may be thinking, I don't run SQL queries. What? It, how can I run into this limit? Well, behind the scenes, Salesforce is running these queries in um, Process Builder. And when you're doing get record elements and update records and delete records of your flows, you are using these queries. And if you reach this limit, the system rolls back the entire transaction. So that can be a real headache to try and figure out which transactions didn't work and what data, what didn't happen that you wanted to happen. So this is something we need to be aware of and, and do some um, education on SQL limits. DML limits. So when we're creating records, we're updating records, we're deleting records, we're actually doing a quote DML and we're allowed 150 per transaction. And one flow, you could use multiple SQL queries and multiple DML statements and without even realizing it unless you really understand what's happening with your automation. So I made a little cheat sheet for myself because I, the documentation on Salesforce just is all text and that just didn't work for me. And I'm like, okay, when am I using a DML statement? When is it a SQL query? And believe it or not, update con update records, delete records, and some actions are using both. So we need to be aware of this, and this also applies to your processes. Now the fun part, now we're finally at the demo. Education over, well, not quite. So I have a flow, and I'm running my flow from an action on a lightning page. And that is one of my favorite GIFs. All of you that know me, uh, that have seen me on Twitter probably know you're gonna see this GIF at some point or another. But I'm using the Aloha GIF to say that my automation is on. I have it switched on. There's my command center. Look at this. And I'm gonna switch that off. Now I'm not deactivating, nothing like that. I'm just gonna switch off. Now let's see what happens when we run our flow. Aha, I stopped the user. Whoopsie, can't go any further. So if this had been, this is my demo of just these little fun gifts, but you would probably have a, a, some kind of a screen for your users, having them fill out a form or something like that. And sometimes we need to switch it off. So that's why we would use our switch. So now that you've seen the switch in action, how do we build it? We're going to go into setup and put in meta and then custom metadata, click new. And this looks a lot like any other object in Salesforce. You're gonna see that. And we give it a name. And I just called it on and off switch. And then in the description, I like to put the variables that I'm going to use for my switch. We're gonna to get to this later but that way I'm very consistent and I know what's happening. And you wanna leave that checkbox for all Apex visible so that you will be able to get to those settings. And then the next step, so I have my custom metadata type. Now I need to create some fields for it. So this is the first most important field of anything you're gonna build and everyone might build this slightly differently. You need an automation number. This is what I figured out, an automation number. I use a text field. That I will explain why I use a text field and not a number field very, very soon. But I have a length of four. I don't anticipate having thousands of these because if I did, boy, that would be a mess. So I have automation number, length of four. Do not allow duplicate values. Very important. Do not allow duplicate values. We only want one of each number so that we can do a lookup and match our number. So we save it and we're going to do one more field. And this time we need that on and off. We need the switch is how I call it, on off switch. I like to do it as a pick list. And I like to have a deliberate entry of none 
as my default. And you're going to see why I do it this way. You may choose something different and that's okay, but this is how I've done it. And I use none because some things I want to show up on my command center, I will not be switching on and off or I can't switch on and off in the case of workflow rules. So I've created two new fields for my custom metadata type. And these are the three fields you end up with. One is the default custom metadata record name. Just like on account name, name is already there for you. We have custom metadata record name. There's my automation number, text four digits long. The reason I'm using it as text is because when you run an auto launch flow, you have to switch it on and off basically you have to trigger that flow to do something through Process Builder. So you have two related automation tools that are doing, that are working together. And so I would have a 105 and a 105 plus. So the 105 would be for my auto launch flow. The 105 plus would be for the Process Builder that's triggering that same flow. So that's why I'm using text so I could get that plus sign and I can see it. We're gonna see this later a little more, so don't worry about it. And then you have the pick list for the on and off. Okay, so this is what a very simple automation command center looks like. You could see here that I have my labels, the name of the automation, and I'm describing them, and I have a naming convention, which I will go into a little bit later. And I have automation number. You see 108 is my auto launch flow. 108 plus is the process that's going to trigger the flow to work in the background. So I have a switch of none on the auto launch flow because that's not where I'm gonna be turning it on and off, but I wanna see it on my list. And that's why I've done it this way. I've added a couple extra fields here. You can add as many as you want for informational purposes. The idea is not just to switch on and off. It's to really be able to see everything that's happening and understanding it from one place instead of just having just the description fields that are given to us on flows and processes where you have no control over adding, you can't add extra fields to, to have more information. So I have my DML so that I know that that's update or that one uh, 101 is a create DML on that screen flow. So here is the naming convention that I've come up with. Now what this is, is actually, I made myself this cheat sheet and I encourage you always to do this for this or for anything else is to come up with a naming convention and stick to it. And a cheat sheet like this really makes life easier because then I know that I can refer back to it and I'm not doing it one way, one time and, and a different way. The number at the beginning is super important because that is the number that I need to match up to the custom metadata record from my flow or my process. And you see the plus there again for the process builder on the create opportunity on the front there. This will make more sense in a minute. Now, for your flows, one thing you should take advantage of is that you can create templates and subflows. And the reason you want to do this is so that you can create the on and off switch one time and then use it over and over and over. So what I'm gonna show you, you only have to do it once and then we can make use. So how, we talked about this really briefly, how do we turn things on and off? From a screen flow, we're gonna use a flow template and we can use that over and over once we've built it once. From an auto launch flow, we're gonna use a criteria mode. And that criterion node, we can also create once and then do save as and reuse it to start every single process builder. So it, our switch is there. You can create a validation rule for yourself. 
on your custom metadata type, just like you can with any other object. So I'm doing this to keep myself straight here because I don't want to switch on and off on the auto launch flow accidentally and get confused as to what is happening. So if I now try to switch on, I made a rule for myself so that I can't. I can't mess it up. So that's one of the things you might want to do, especially if you have more than one admin and you're building it and they're not quite sure, is make use of validation rules. So here is our switch. Now, this is what we would use for a screen flow. We want something at the beginning of our screen flow to turn it on and off automatically based on our setting. <clears throat> and so this is it. We're going to go into more detail in a moment. But basically, we have an automation number. And then we're going to go look at the custom metadata and see whether the switch is on or off for that number. So here we are. We can see just on the command center. The numbers 108, 108 plus, 105, 101, those are the numbers we're looking for. And the switches off, on, on. So this is the flow template. The very first thing we need to do is we're going to be saving this as, saving this as, and I'll show you that in a moment, but we need to give it a number when we're starting a flow. I'm starting a brand new flow, I'm going to give it a number of 105. And then I have a lookup to my custom metadata type and I want to match that number. I want to say, is there a 105 there? And then I, you see switch, I'm looking for the setting. When no records are returned, set variables to null. That's really helpful in debugging and you should always do that. Because then I know, and you're going to see in a moment, whether I made a mistake in assigning my automation number. Here we go. I always check myself along in every flow. I have checks along the way to make sure I don't have any errors. And this one is invalid, meaning I'm checking to see that I didn't put in 10057, which doesn't exist on a record for my switch because then the whole thing doesn't work if you have that problem. So I have an error screen, probably don't need that. It's nice to have actually for my debug, which we're gonna see in a moment. And the fault email we're gonna use, especially if the user does something and then uh, I need to be notified. The decision is now checking, what does the switch say? We found the number. Does it say on or off? or none. And I say in my logic, if it's off or if it's none, it's off. Otherwise, it's on. And I do a really quick assignment. This is just so that it looks beautiful and it's easy to debug. I have one little uh, Boolean field that says switch on or off. And I do an assignment saying true or false. And then you see the Aloha screen. So if you start this way as your template, you can take off that screen, and you'll see that in a moment, and move on with your flow, but it's great for testing. So here's how to create a template. You create your flow. We've just done that, and we edit it, and we checkbox template. Then we can create a view from the flow and see which are our templates, and we know we are always going to be doing a save as on these templates. We're not going to use it. We're not going to write over this. We're going to do a save as and start a new flow. The way you get to that is through edit. OK, so this is our template. And let's open it and let me show you how we're going to use our template. Save as, new flow. That's it. Save as, new flow. Then we're going to give it a name. Screen flow. That's how we would use our template. And now I've saved it as a new one. And I'm going to assign a number to it. 
So basically you do a save as new flow and assign a new number. Let's run the debug and see what it looks like. I don't need the record ID, I have it there in case I need it. And my switch is on. And I have for myself a little screen test one, two, three. So the debug shows us that our 122 that we assign matches to a record. And that's why it knows that the switch is on. And that's the basic of that. Now, let's disconnect our test screen and actually put a real flow here. Now, I would be building out a flow here, but I'm just going to use a subflow for demonstration. And this is also best practice is to try and use subflows wherever you can and it also starts new transactions. There's a lot of advantages to using subflows. So now we're going to use a subflow attached because we know that our switch is on and that's what we wanted. And let's debug this and you can see this work. Let's run it. And now we have our subflow running, which is an address search for a user and we have our switch on. And then if I were to go to my custom metadata and switch off, then this would not be showing the address search for that user or in any case for anyone. So that's why we can use the switch and that's how we use a template to save as a new flow. Remember that your templates, you wouldn't need to activate that. There's no reason to activate a template because it's never going to be used on its own. So that's great usability. I've showed you how to turn on and off, on and off, but that's a global switch we've been doing right there. Now I want to take it to the next level because my use case is that I have one user that does bulk operations and sometimes those bulk operations, I don't want certain automation to run. And then I have power users. Now, sometimes I want to pilot something. I've done testing, I've done user acceptance, all of that. But sometimes when it's first coming out and you really want to see it in production, you really want to see what's happening, or you only trust certain things with certain people, not necessarily by their profile or by their role, just a certain user, I have power user. And I also have restricted because there's sometimes some users, I don't want to be able to do certain things. I don't trust them for various reasons, or there's a reason why that user, even though they're of a certain profile, should not be triggering or using a certain automation. So this is my use case, and these three things made sense to me more so than profiles and uh, roles, but you could still use profiles and roles in your automation command center, just be slightly different. And I like that they're Booleans. They're either on or off, check boxes. So that makes life a little easier. And the only the other thing that I've added here is a global checkbox. Because I still want the functionality to be on and off for everyone, but sometimes I want to use it for the user. So here we are. This is how it would work when we want to match up to our users. On the user record, I've made three custom fields or boolean fields checkbox fields on the user record and you already saw those same three fields on our command center and basically what i'm looking for is a match because if they're both the same it says restricted on one and restricted on the other that's the setting that i'm looking for so my template my screen flow template looks almost identical to the one we saw before one difference, I've added in a current user subflow. So now, rather than just looking, is it on off, I want to know what is what does the user record say? And now match that. So how do I know who my running user is? I've created a subflow, and this is a really simple subflow. I'm going to tell you how to do this. Seems like, how would I know who my running user is? ID equals current user ID. Now that is referring to a formula. So I'm going to get to that formula in a minute, but that's referring to a formula when no records are returned, null. And I'm pulling in more than just my couple of fields. I'm pulling in anything that I feel like I might need 
because I'm already using up a get record. So for me, why not do it there instead of having to do it again and again? And here's my formula. I found user from the global variables and then ID. User and then ID from global variable. Now, all those global var variables are available when you do a formula. But let me show you something. The reason I had to use a formula, and let's take a look together. There is a reason. If I try to get to the record variable, the global variable here, it's not available. There is no user here. I only have flow variables. So that's why we need the formula first. So I create this little get records using my formula, super, super easy. And now this is my subflow that I'm using in my automation switch. So the switch is almost identical to the one we saw earlier. Very, very similar. And we're still going to get our custom metadata records from our automation switch. And now we just want to know what the setting is on the current user, which we pulled in with our subflow. And now our logic is pertaining to not only is it on off, is there a global checkbox, but what is the user setting? So you have all of these different variables. And if you do this, and depending on how many things you want to look for and whether you're always using global or you decide to use the user side, it can be very complicated. You could scroll down and have, you know, 50 different things down there in your decision. So I make use of formulas and I use my formulas in my decision. So first I'll match up a couple of things. Is it are they equal, the one from the user record, the one from the custom metadata? And then, you know, is it true? And so this is going to vary depending on how you decide to build this for yourself. But my little tip is to use formulas. So now let's see that in action. Let's see this type of command center that we have global and user capability all in one command center. So we're going to take a look. Right now we're at global on, global on. So that's what we saw the Aloha earlier. Let's edit it and let's switch off. And then let's take off global. So we're saying off for my restricted user. If my user has restricted checkbox on his user record, they cannot use this solution. Let's click Aloha. I stopped my user. Oh, that was me. I guess I'm restricted. Am I restricted? Let's take a look. Oh, my user record. I'm restricted. That's why I could not get to Aloha because my setting was restricted. And we set the custom metadata to say off for all restricted users. What I'm saying here is it's on for everyone else, just off for restricted. And the best use case there many times is off for bulk operations. I do that one more often than anything else is on for everybody else, off for bulk users. And then what I do is Hold on one second. Okay, we'll get to this. I'll get back to that. So what do we do in Process Builder? How do we turn a Process Builder on and off? Slightly different. What we're going to do here is put a criteria mode at the beginning of our process with a stop and basically use a formula. And our formula is going to be the same idea as the flow. We're going to look to our custom metadata and look for the certain number of our custom metadata record that are matching. You see this is named Process Builder 108 plus Auto Launch Demo Trigger. We're matching 108 to our custom metadata. And then the same idea. This is pretty cool. We can actually 
still have it on and off for certain users here. Amazing. Even though Process Builder is running in system mode, if we do our switch, we can turn it off for our bulk operations. So we have more flexibility here than we would any other way so that the process, the auto launch flow will work for everyone else except our bulk operations user. So how do we get to these, how do we get user bulk operations equals true and the custom metadata? I'm gonna show you that in just a moment here. One thing we want to do if this happens and we're turning it off is we need an action. So I have a do nothing flow action. I'm going to tell you where that comes from in just a moment. So look at that custom metadata types right there for us when we go to our global system variables. Automation command center 108 plus is what we're looking for. The setting that's why 108 plus matches to 108 plus. And now we go down and we look for switch or on off, on off or none. Remember that? And then let me show you how you can find the user variables, system variables. There it is, current user right there for us, silver plate. And then I'm looking for. restricted and then I'm going to choose that and use that in my formula so that's how you get to these things now in process builder this can get a little more complicated so you only want to do this one time most of it but sometimes you want things on and off so you're going to have to make some minor changes to each one but if you build it one time and then you just make the minor changes to your formula that is the easiest thing when you're refactoring you only need to change you can't change the api name but what you want to change is your label there your process name so if you already have a lot of existing automation you can add your number and rename it under the name and not worry about the API. So with flows and with processes. The template checkbox here doesn't do us as much good as it would with our flows because it doesn't show up in your list of processes. For whatever reason, template doesn't show up. I think it's meant more in this case for um, developers. And it also will not, um, you can't create your own views for processes. I don't know why you can in flows. You can't create a list view. You're stuck with the way Salesforce has it. So that's why our naming convention is super, super important. Now that do nothing flow there, that came from ericsplayground.wordpress.com, Eric R. Smith came up with that idea for the do nothing uh, flow, which I use now in Process Builder to get a process node that actually does nothing. It was a brilliant idea. So I wanna give credit where credit is due. So now we have all of our automation and we have our custom metadata types and we have our user records and now you want to test it and beyond a debug we need to test in every scenario and coming up with it depends on on what how many of these things or or what you're trying to match up to a profile or to an alias or or some other um, division or something some other criteria that you're turning on and off for and what i do is i create a spreadsheet create some kind of list so that I know how to what to test and make sure that I've tested it and what result I'm anticipating to happen with that list. And I use a truth table uh, generator to just get me started. And then off of that, I kind of build my uh, list uh, because let's say bulk was true and power is true, but restricted is false. And my switch is on or my switch is off or my switch is not. I want to know what's actually going to happen. And I want to know 
when I run my debug, does it actually happen the way I anticipated it happening? And this would be the best way to do the testing. Wow, I blew through that pretty quick. <laughs> so I guess now we'll open to questions. All right. Um, so we have one question from Brian. Hi, Brian. Um, he asks, where does Monica keep her cheat sheets? Oh, I have, uh, I created a custom object in Salesforce called config. And uh, I keep all my cheat sheets in config. All right, great. Michelle says, Monica is available for consulting as we try to do this ourselves, right? <laughs> <laughs> for a cost, Michelle. <laughs> right, right about the video is you can do it over and over. And the really, and what I stress here is that really, if I can do this, you can too. And the thing is, everyone's use case is slightly different. And the global on-off switch is a great way to start because that's super easy compared to when you get into the user record but get a dev org start messing around it's so much fun and really you will you will know flow and you will understand everything so much better the more you actually have hands on and you get in there and and you do it yourself and i think it's almost better than having um an app that just is is given to you in this case because you have so much flexibility and so many things you can do Right, so a reminder, folks, you can either submit your questions via the question feature or on the um, Trailblazer Community Salesforce Automation Hour. So I'll do a refresh, but um, I do see another question from Mr. Brian Kwong. Um, have you run into issues with users who don't have the view set up or viewing other users' permissions with the switch? Um, they don't have to have, oh, let's see. My users don't have view set up, but they have to have permission read only on the user, on the user record, I believe. I've made sure that they have view only, and you can give them view only on just those three fields, the custom fields that really don't have any real information on them. All right, while well, we give folks a second to post any additional questions, Monica, how long did it take for you to put this all together? Uh oh, I don't even want to. <laughs> I just had the idea and then I messed around and then I built my switch, I don't know, 10 different ways until I came up with the plus sign and the different things. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, now it won't be so bad for y'all if anybody <laughs> wants to do it. Um, you know, and this proves that you just get an idea and you can build something. You know, that's the amazing thing about Salesforce. So it's just experimentation to see what works and what doesn't. Right, and Brian responds, thanks Monica, for reference, I had issues with CMDT and custom perms and flow process builder unless they had view set up. Also, hello back at ya. <laughs> oh, okay. Ah, I don't think my users had view set up, but I will double check that. Let me refresh the Trailblazer community in case anyone posted out there. Okay, um, last call for any, oh, Michelle, have you considered using this to flip from user to system mode in a flow? User to system mode. What does she mean by that? All right, Michelle, we're gonna need you to clarify. 
because a screen flow, I don't believe there's anything you can do to override that. But in a process, you can kind of simulate user mode. I'll give Michelle a couple seconds to, all right. Flows run in user mode, but if I want it to run in system mode, can that be done? Not that I know of. What about you guys? Do you have any ideas on that, uh, Rakesh or Jen? No, uh, I don't think so that is possible. Okay, thanks Rakesh. Uh, Brian, in theory, items after a wait element or scheduled actions and process builder are in system mode, but you cannot have screens. Thanks, Brian. All right, last call. Okay, I'm not seeing anything on the Trailblazer community, and Michelle says this is awesome. Thanks, Monica. I echo that. Um, so rather than hold people up any longer, since I know it's a Friday, I will uh, <laughs> thank you, Monica, for this mind blown. Um, <laughs> and come back if you have any iterations on this, or to come back and present anything else that you want on automation. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll think on it. Thank I already you. have ideas for the next version. So cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining and until next time. Thanks. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Have a great weekend. Bye bye.